Bryce was excited. He said, he said, he was excited. He said, thank you so much. Got a dog back there. Um, um, tonight he's in real form. I'm trying to keep him quiet. I'm just like, can't <laughs> him by the window and he's losing his mind. All right. Good evening and welcome to the special edition of Showtime TV. I'm your host, Omar Rashid. Uh, today's uh, show is visual artists. <laughs> I've been a while since I did a show on visual artists and I have two of the best in the world. It's here this evening. It is such an honor and pleasure. Um, I'm so grateful to be in the presence of such great artists. We have Miss Eunice LaFate and we have Demetrius Motion Bullock. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for being a guest on tonight's program. Thank you. I'm honored, man. I'm honored. Thank oh, thank you. You. I am very delighted to be on again with you, Amar. All right. Okay. Such an honor. Okay. We're going to start off with Miss Eunice. Let's talk briefly about how you got started. Um, being a visual artist. But well, once again, we'll start off with Miss Eunice. Okay, well, well, let me take you back <laughs> across the globe to Jamaica, because that's where it started. As a child, I was just fascinated with the beauty of nature around me. And I didn't have the luxury of the markers, the brush, the paints, etc. Mm -hmm. My tools were a fire, a charcoal burned from the wood charcoal stick, pencil, and my pen and ink. You know those pen and ink you dip in the pen in the ink fountain? Now, you guys probably don't know those things. That's where I began. <laughs> okay. And at age seven, I, I was asked that big question. And what do you want to be when you grow up? My response, an artist and a teacher. So from the wall, the canvas was the wall of my home. And I would go around with my charcoal stick and my pencil and mark up the walls, not to the de delight of my dad. But that's where it began. Right. Okay, Demetrius? Uh, I got to take you back to the Bronx. <laughs> <laughs> About uh, 1975, I'd say, I, I just started falling in love with the subway cars that would go past my window um, outside of my apartment and with the graffiti art that I would see. Was, I was drawn to it. I was drawn to the, you know, the uh, stories that were being told that were moving, uh, the colors. I was fascinated by it. And um, I started creating. Um, I didn't have any art tools. And, and my mother saw that I took a liking to art. So she would go out and buy me some things. And as I got older, and I was able to earn my own little money from chores or a little summer job I had. I would go out and start buying uh, designer markers. So I heard that, that was the tool used for artists, you know, graffiti artists and everything. I took my, tried my hand at graffiti as well, but uh, it, it turned out it wasn't really my thing as far as going in the subways and stuff. So I mainly just came to, went into drawing, learning how to draw and learning how to draw the anatomy and the body and different figures and I fell in love with comic books. And that was like my greatest teacher, I think, as far as learning how to draw, um, you know, what I didn't know as far as the anatomy, the backs, the side profile, things. And, Look at it, and then I would take it creating. But most importantly, I just wanted to learn how to, to create things that would make people that would want to gravitate towards. You know, with using color and, and a story within the artwork that you know, kind of when you're looking at it, you can always find something different. Okay, uh, Demetri, I, I think you got a little static in, in the background. Uh, I believe, okay. but uh, right. it might be my fan. Hold on, let me turn that off. Oh, okay, yeah, I think a little static. Yeah, okay, there we go. Okay, that's that's better. Okay, there we go. I got I got, I got to hear, hear you nice and clear. <laughs> okay, cool. I'm gonna start off with Miss Miss Eunice. I want to ask you to um, how how do you go about uh knowing what to draw? Um, does this come to you? Do do you write it down? Do do you brainstorm? Uh, what what how, okay. how do you get the ideas? Yeah. Uh, well, if I go back to my childhood, whatever was around me, I would draw. Okay. Then I became a teacher. And it was required that for every lesson you teach, you must have a visual aid. So I started creating visual aid for my classes. So after I immigrated to the United States, I taught at mm -hmm. um, a local Catholic school and I used art as the center of all the subject areas. I did general 
subject teaching. Um, <laughs> sister described my classroom as a, a mini museum. Mm -hmm. So what I put on paper or in canvas, it, it's from the heart in the first place. However, there are themes. I have various themes. And the classroom impacted my work when I moved here. Mm -hmm. I had to deal with issues of diversity or getting children to understand each other and not to pick and not to use slurs or call names. And the core of my work today is about diversity, racial harmony, unity, and justice. Right. All right, Demetri, same question. Um, for me, um, some artwork comes to me like, like right away. Some of them come to me in my dream. I'm laying down sleeping. Um, uh, just like uh, Miss Eunice, I love life. I love the beauty of, you know, what's, what's presented to us. And the way my mind works is sometimes I'll look at things and, and I'll say, hmm, I wonder how it would be if it was like this. You know, it's like a, almost like a what if, and I and I can, you know, and as artists, we have that ability of being able to show you something that isn't seen, you know. So I I, I strive for you know that and work towards that. And sometimes there's uh you know I'll put it down on paper and you know the behind the scenes is is incredible for an artist, especially when you you know you're creating because you get to see the finished product, but sometimes it's like a, it's like a cycle of things in order to in order before you go through and actually see what you want the world to see, you know, and then other times it just flows. So um, for me, I, I use a lot of things. There's a lot of things as inspiration for me, um, you know, again, with life, characters. Um, I like to tell stories, urban stories. Everything has an urban twist to it. Some right. sort of, and, and it just has a, and it just flows depending on the, the, uh, the nature. Right. May so, I follow may I, up? Go ahead, go ahead, Ms. Go ahead, yeah. Ms. Hughes, I'm sorry. Yeah, may I follow up on what um, Denise just talked about experience or what you experience and how that impacts your art. Recall mm -hmm. that I told you that nature influenced my art. Mm -hmm. And here's a piece oh, that okay. I did. It's, awesome. called, it's called Morning Glory. And it was a flower that grew up in patches around me. And mm -hmm. the leaves, the petals open in the morning and precisely at four o'clock Jamaica mm -hmm. time, the petals close. And I would mm -hmm. stand up and watch them and hurry up in the morning to see them open. So yeah. this piece is titled Morning Glory. And that was what inspired my childhood art. You know, one of the things that, that impressed me about a visual artist is when you know there, there may be a particular location, and there someone is sitting down, and they're, they're drawing a portrait of the person. They're, they're, they're drawing the person, him or herself. Um, do you two do that? Do, 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 like, like for example, someone came up to you and say, I, "I want you to draw me." So let, let me just sit right here and draw me. <laughs> do you do that? <laughs> I, I've done it in sorry, cut you, I've done it in New York when I was riding on the subway. Uh -huh. um, one day I just, you know, I'm sitting there and I had my art stuff on me and I'm looking around at the crowded train and and there was a woman that was sitting across from me and and the way how she was sitting, it it, it would, you know, her expression, it just told a story. So I sat mm -hmm. there and I drew her without her even knowing. Um, oh. Yeah, and then she happened to look up and she noticed me looking at her and then going back down to my page and she, and I saw her give a little smile and then she tried to act natural. You know, she tried to she tried to act like she didn't know what I was doing. She tried to sit there and pretend that I wasn't drawing her, you know, but I already had the, the first image locked in my head. So I continued drawing what I saw and then I just used everything else, you know, to fill in. And I gave her that picture. But um, yeah, it, it's, it's an amazing feeling when people, you know, when we're able to do that, you know, I try to be a little faster at doing yeah. it. You know, because that, that's the thing, you want to make sure you get your subject and not hold them too long or in case they move. But, you know, um, for the times that I did do that, it was fun. Yeah. I, I, just want, oh, I just want to make a distinction between folk art and fine art. I was okay. never trained formally. I received mm. uh, minimal training when I attended Teachers College in Jamaica and just line shaped mm. colors and the color wheel. I right. taught myself the other skills and Fine art, when Demetrius say 
he sat and drew somebody. If you mm. want a portrait, don't ask you in a slave, go to K.O. Sims. K.O. Sims. Yes, <laughs> I'm not a portrait artist, I am folk. And uh, oh. they used to ask me, and why you round off the hands? Where are the fingers? Where you're from? People don't have fingers. So my art may look crude in some ways if I try to draw people. So I stay away from portraits because I leave that to the professionals. Right. I'm, I'm glad you mentioned folk art because, you know, it seems, in all actuality, um, I never really heard of folk art until I met you. So, so for those who are not as keen to what folk art is, can you, can you briefly describe what it is? Well, um, in, in essence, folk art is A-R-T from the H-E-A-R-T, art from the heart. It comes naturally. There are no rules. You don't okay. have to make the lines vanish. And it does not have to be accurate and precise. It can be raw, mm -hmm. just the way you feel about the subject, rather asking about the perspective or why it doesn't have the vanishing lines. Ask me, what is the story behind that piece? Mm -hmm. That's what folk art is. There is a storyline behind each work of art. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, as I say that, let me show this piece. Okay. <laughs> oh, yeah, I love nice. that. And the, the pandemic yeah. was a rude awakening for many of us. And you remember when we were put on lockdown? Right. And right. I had no choice but to take my brush paints materials home. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. I concluded that the beauty of nature was not on lockdown. And then I put my Bob Marley music on. Okay. And then I created, don't worry about the thing, because yeah, every yeah. little thing's going to be all right. Be all right. It's really nice. So this came yeah. out of the pandemic. <laughs> so so let, me, let me ask you, too. Um, is there any type of, uh, I guess, drawing or pieces that you may not do because of your um, morals and values? We start off with Miss Eunice and then Demetrius. Mm, that's a good Look, I take on the issues head on. I am not afraid. I use my canvas to address social justice. Back to 2020, with the George Floyd situation and the marches across our nation, cities, states, and the world, I created this piece. And it's titled K-N-O-W Justice, K-N-O-W Peace. Because the marchers were saying, no justice as in N-O justice, no peace as in no peace. And all peace, but I made it K N O W. Let's get them to no justice right. and no peace. Right. You know that, that's very interesting, Miss Hughes, because I'm, I'm sorry, Miss. That's very interesting because you know you you're using your form of visual arts uh, as a form of, um, I guess, so social justice, if you will. You know, when we think about social justice, we think about marching. We think about protesting. We talk about someone speaking on the bullhorn. We're talking about. Um, uh, boycotting certain things, but but visual artists and, and social movements, you know, that, that, that's something that's uh, many people may not, may not be aware of or think about. Yes, and that's what artists do: use our canvas to address issues. Right. Yeah, yeah. I did a piece uh, a while back. It was just sold by a, a collector out in Cali, and um, it was on. Uh, it was a piece that I actually did years ago. It was in uh, one of the civil rights exhibits down at the Delaware State, and uh, it was called. Um, it was it called Endangered. Originally, it was called Endangered. This one was um, I Am a Man, where I did the uh, the Afro on the mm -hmm. subject where he was crying, um, with the flag behind it, um, and showing everybody holding you know like the the I Am a Man banners which were floating down from the sky, and it was a caption at the bottom with the two children looking at a TV screen where it had the actual march that was taking place within the TV screen um, back in the civil rights. And uh, for me, I, I just, I'll take on any subject. I'll take on any subject. That is probably my only political one that I've done as an artist, um, you know, expressing just the, the, the power, the movement of that time and how it moved me as an artist, what I will not do is draw any pictures that show us in any other light other than what we are as kings and queens. 
You know, I like to show us powerful. I like to show us different, um, you know, in different ways, um, whether it be futuristic style, realistic style, you know, I don't want to show anything other than that. That's awesome. I'm going to start off with you, Demetrius. Um, how, how long does it take you to, to draw uh, any piece that you do? I'm going to ask the same question to you, Ms. Eunice, because I, I would figure that, you know, when, when you're drawing, um, I'm quite sure you, you take your time. You, you want to make sure everything is right, the angle is right, that the width is right. Um, so, I mean, does it take hours to draw? Does, does, it, does it take half an hour to draw? Or, or kind of, I guess it depends on what, what you do. It depends. It depends. I mean, I've, I've done pictures that, uh, you know, took months to do, depending on the detail. Okay. Um, it, there was a picture I did called um, When Sticks Rule. It was, uh, I had this, it was this, this is going back to that what if thing where I look at subjects and I say, oh, let's try it this way. So it was a world of gigantic pool sticks that came down and snatched the people and put them on pool sticks and had to play the game to let people see what it felt like. You know to be hit by the balls and everything and drew the whole area the the, the giant pool sticks were playing with people and the background everything in the picture was pool sticks but looking like people oh uh, there was a lot of detail that went into that picture um and that took a, a couple of months and and then there's others that kind of i mean it's just it flows so well it's like i may begin it like the beginning of the, the morning started in the beginning of the morning and I'm up till the next morning because I just couldn't stop. I wanted to complete the picture. So, you know, 24 hours, it'll be done, you know. And then there's other pictures that I could do within, a, you know, a few hours, depending it's paint, there's drawing, there's pen work and digital. You know, I just started doing a lot of digital artwork. Oh, okay, um, gotcha. Books and stuff. And, and with that, with the digital drawing, um, you know, you have a lot of tools that allow you to do things a lot faster. You don't have to wait for paint, you know, ink to dry, of course. And, um, you know, you can you can move your subject on the computer and everything if you need to place it right and, you know, add different elements. So, you know, that could be done within hours. Right. Ms. Eunice, same question. Uh, for me, it's pretty interesting. I moved here in the winter. It was mm -hmm. a brutal winter of 1983. Never experienced winter before. So the way I coped with my nostalgia was to paint. I spent hours on certain pieces and I recall we had a week of snow. So I mm -hmm. stayed home and within that week I created may maybe 20 pieces. And you can't even pay me to paint in the summer. I'm strictly mm -hmm. a winter painter. That's when my okay. adrenaline flows. Okay. And the colder it is and more snow, then I get the mm -hmm. energy to create works of art. Right. Uh, and Ms. Hughes, I, I want to go back to you. You mentioned earlier that, that, that you, you were a teacher, instructor of, of uh, artists. Um, so in terms of your students, how old were they? Um, was it folk art that, that you was teaching or was it regular art? Um, so talk, talk about okay, more well, specific. I, right. OK, I did elementary education. So okay. it would be from kindergarten and up. And I love the, the kindergarten because they don't worry about it doesn't look right and give me another paper etc they just are very free and yeah. i taught art up to high school level granted that i was never trained formally as a as an art teacher mm -hmm. oh, but wow. I've, I've, I've done extensive work in folk in creating art and helping children by the way make it very current since february Reverend Kevin Benjamin, who is a keyboard musician, and I, and a guy named Aaron, he's a drummer. We have been taking the art, you might have seen my videos, taking the art to the community in after school programs. It is amazing. The kinds of work we're seeing coming, I am seeing coming from these students. We have Camp Victory, they, are, they have very interesting name, Camp Hope. And this, the children are so very engaged and they're, I, they can't copy. And that's another thing. When I take a class, you can, I show you my samples, I put them away. You can't copy my work. You must create right. it from the heart yeah. because right. that is folk art, art from the heart. And it must be original. I also teach children the value of their work. I say, okay, you're leaving here. This piece could be priced at whatever. 
I want them to understand that it, art is more than beauty, art is wealth. Mm -hmm. Right, right. And Ms. Yunus, uh, how, how popular is Falk Art? I mean, is it something that is well known worldwide or is it? Oh, just, yes, uh, it is. Okay. There, there was a guy named Bill Trailer from Alabama. Okay. And at age 80, he started creating art while working in a funeral home at night. He would pick up charcoal or whatever and some cardboard made art. He, he made 1,600 pieces before he passed. They sold for millions of dollars all over. Mm -hmm. And then mm -hmm. there was Grandma Moses, another famous folk artist. So folk art has gotten to a very high esteem. And I could not say that without talking about well-mentioned a place to be somebody. This yeah. work of art has become my most prestigious work during the pandemic. International journalists, journalists were here, they interviewed me about it. And Wilmington, a place to be somebody is now in governor, former governor Markel, bought a copy of this, and it's okay. now in France in his office. Oh, that's so awesome. yes, this speech, I highly establish the fact that our city is a very great city. Right, awesome. Awesome. So Demetrius, have you ever talked? Oh, yes, I have. I was actually brought on as a FIFA service counselor back in New York, um, helping oh, okay. with addiction um, and, uh, you know, children at risk. And I was asked to implement, I guess, an arts program within the, the structure of um, treatment and working with the clients. And uh, from there, I, I, you know, I found that, you know what, I, I would like to do this. I would like to teach, you know, young children, you know, especially, you know, at my age when I when I first started because frankly I didn't have anybody that looked like me that was able to teach me and show me things and things like that I, I did I went to Catholic school and you know I had an art teacher and surprisingly sometimes there were some things that she couldn't draw and she would call me up to the front mm -hmm. class wow. and I draw it <laughs> <laughs> really and um so from the program I um when we moved down here to Delaware my family and I my wife and I um, we, you know, I started working down here and I, um, what was my first one? I started working for an outside agency. Oh, um, gotcha. yeah, um, it was run by, um, the Pritchetts down here in Delaware and they work with some at risk children as well down here. And I was able to go out there and, and, uh, work alongside them and, and work with, a, you know, in teaching children arts programs. Then I started working at AI DuPont. They got a wind of me and they wanted me to come into um, AI DuPont Middle School and um, work with uh, the children on some of the state programs here, uh, putting them in, you know, contests. Uh, I worked alongside several children. Uh, two of them were able to go to the final of the uh, arts program. They didn't win, but we got, you know, we got that far. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And, and then... Um, the two artists who made it that far, I got to work alongside and we had uh, designed this big arts uh, piece that was hanging up at the district of the of the school, the Red Clay School District. Um, and from there, I've gone on to work at Christiana Cultural Arts Center for the summer, working with children on art and I'm putting together an arts program now so that you know we can work over at uh, Artscape. I like to do something at Artscape with them children, more so in teaching them how to create uh, books right you know right. It, that's that's a need and um and using whatever artistry whatever talents you have in order to create you know your imagery to your story right Ms. Yunus, you want to I say something that, yeah i i want to explain the power of the arts <laughs> and uh, when i i'm a visual artist but i also use music and drama good the good kind of drama <laughs> and journaling and all kinds of art. Mm -hmm. In 2004, I was hired by Kingswood Community Center to teach life skills in a program called Project Stay Free, a 12 hour day. It was a long day for the those students were literally kicked out, not physically, out of a school district and put into that 12 day program. They claimed they could not um, be in a normal environment, which to me wasn't right when I, experience and talents in them. So uh, this 
work of art is titled Arts as Prevention. There's mm -hmm. a boy there with, uh, with the, the microphone, with a hat turned backwards. He was a rapper in my classroom and would disrupt. I put him aside. I said, I know what you can do with the wrapping. Go cut a CD, sell it on the sidewalk for $5. And he did. So I invited them to show their art and to come to my exhibition. And the boy walked in and he said, Miss LaFayette, that's me. <laughs> and I said, sure, it's you. Mm -hmm. And they called them at risk. But at Job Corps, my last job before I retired, we called them at promise. And I had an affirmation for them every morning among the other affirmation. I am not at risk, I'm at promise. Because I mean, these, we call them at risk, but they're not at risk. Society is at risk by not providing for their basic needs. I'm gonna use that from now on. I like oh, that. Yeah, that's, that's yes, awesome. they are not at risk, they are at promise. I like that. And we need to find the promise in them and yeah, develop right. that promise. Let me, let me throw this question in the air. Um, how do you two go about pricing your work? I mean, is it, is it by size? Is it, do you price it based on how long it, it took you to, to, to draw it? Um, how does a visual artist go about pricing their work? Um, you want me to answer? Oh, either one of you. <laughs> okay. Well, <laughs> I, when I started out, I was my work was actually being given away. For, but I didn't know the value of my work, so they were low, low, low prices. Since okay. I've gained my notoriety, and I've worked very hard for it, my pieces now, you know, they have a price. I take, for example, this piece, Wilmington, A Place to Be Somebody, mm -hmm. which is now international. The mm -hmm. journal, as I said, journalists from the national, uh, international stage came to my gallery, interviewed me about the piece. This piece is now among my highest price pieces. So, you know, I, I won't quote the figure, but it doesn't come cheap. <laughs> that's, that's, <laughs> that's one thing there. And the size quick. does not matter. I have mm -hmm. miniatures which have very high value. Oh, my 2020 pieces. And I'm going to say this, they're priced 2020, regardless of their size. Because 2020 was that year that will go down in history, the pandemic year. Everything yeah. I created during the pandemic is priced 2020. You're talking two, zero, two, zero. That's right. right. That's right. Wow. I got to say, um, when we first moved down here um, to Delaware, um, I was introduced to a woman uh, name, uh, I think her name is uh, Miss Fergie. I believe his name is Miss Fergie. And I just, we happened to run across each other because I was had, selling some of my art at a flea market, believe it or not. I was, I had dropped off some books at a library and as I was pulling out, something told me to just make a left and, you know, and go over there. And I drove over there and I seen that they were setting up for a flea market and they said I could just come in and set up and, you know, put some of my artwork up. So I felt like doing it, you know, I wanted to put it up. And I met this wonderful woman named Eva, I forget, um, I forgot, I forgot her last name, goodness. But anyway, she spoke of uh, Miss Lafayette and she said, she's a good friend of mine and uh, I would love for you to meet her. And she, you know, she's going to be at the governor's ball downtown Wilmington. She said, I could get you in. I get you a ticket. I could get you in. And I, I got in, and I got in there and I'm sitting up at the top, top seats of, at the, um, at the, uh, what is that? The, what was the, uh, uh, I forgot the location, <laughs> but yeah. I'm sitting up there. Yeah, the grand. I'm sitting up grand. there. Yeah. Yes. And then I'm looking down, and then they announced Miss Lafayette as she came on. No, oh, that she, was the Governor's Award for the Arts the in 2014. Yes. yes. Yes, I was there. And that was the first time I got a chance to meet Miss, Miss Lafayette, you know, that night. But when she received that award, I was like so inspired. I was like, that's where I would like to be. I would love to meet her and that's where I would like to be. And now I'm sharing the screen with you. I just wanted to bring that up. <laughs> but, <laughs> but, but, and when it goes to pricing, you know, my work, even when I when I saw Mr. Fade and I'm looking at the prices and everything, I never knew how to really price my work because I love, you know, it is just something that I love to do, you know, and, and I didn't know how to price it. Um, uh, 
it wasn't until somebody purchased one of my pieces at a very high value and wanted to just own the piece, purchase at a high value. And I was like, okay, well, I said, I gotta, you know, I gotta do some research on this because it seems to be, you know, people love what I do, it's a market for it. You know, if I'm doing personalized pieces, I may do it per square inch. Mm -hmm. I said by per square inch, maybe a dollar per square inch, 50 cents per square inch, depending on the detail or whatever is going into the creation of it. Any personalized pieces that I do, you know, I'll put them at a, a, a much larger value if I'm not making any copies of them, because I, I don't like making copies of a lot of my work. And if I Me do too. make copies, they're very limited. I keep them at maybe a hundred, a hundred prints. The prints I keep may, nine to five. I'm five, five prints. May do it at a hundred, you know, three hundred dollars for a print, four hundred dollars for a print, two hundred dollars for a print. And the originals, you know, for those who are collectors who want the originals, they know that this is the this is the amount that's out there. So it, it varies in price, it varies in price. But for me, uh, Mr. Fate, I knew. I said, I've got to raise the bar. <laughs> and I've, I've mentored a lot of young artists in this city, help them to price their work. And yes. I had the joy of mentoring a, a youth artist last year from June through January. Her name is Deborah Tate. She had this stage in my gallery for Women's History Month. She had approximately 25 pieces and she sold an original piece. So mm -hmm. it is my goal to advocate for artists. I don't want them to sell their work cheap. I mean, yeah. I'm, I've helped them to put up a, a value on their work. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's, it is a, you know, as artists, you know, it's, it, you know, we're, we're transparent. What you see is what's in our heart, our mind. You know, mm -hmm. we put it out there for the world to see. There really isn't a price you can put on anything that we create. It's However, true. we gotta give it a value. We have to give it a value. And it could be the time, it could be the subject. It could be, you know, the materials that you used, um, mm -hmm. depending on the time. Like you said, it, it happened during the pandemic. And that's, you know, that was a, a very critical time for a lot of people. A lot of people found, re, um, I guess, refound themselves in a lot yeah. of ways. Got to learn a lot about themselves during that time. So there is a value, you know. So let, let, let me ask this follow-up question. Uh, Demetrius, I, I saw a post that you did on Facebook uh, maybe about a week or two weeks ago. Uh, you sold one of your pieces. Yeah, right? yeah, 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 yeah. You were smiling. So, so, so I want to ask you too, as visual artists, um, what's the feeling like after after you sell your pieces? I mean, is it the greatest feeling in the world? You like, yeah, yeah that's what's up. I mean, I mean wow. What, 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 what those Can I go mind? first? So, yeah, go ahead, Demetrius. <laughs> in 2019, my business faced. Uh, financial crisis. It was at the verge of, I was at the verge of closing my storefront. My oh. art started as a hobby and it grew into a home-based business. And after 22 years, when I lost my dear loved one, I moved it to a storefront. But it had gotten the point, I was draining my little retirement to keep it open. And I, thanks to Dwayne Sims, now treasurer, who came in and sat down with me and went over my expenses and income, yeah. et cetera, and guided me, preventing me from closing my business. Mm -hmm. And it's a good thing I didn't close. It should have been closed in February of 2020, the month before the pandemic. Well, after the lockdown in July, one man came into my gallery and purchased four original paintings. Yeah, I call it my pandemic windfall. <laughs> that was the turning point for my mm -hmm. business. Wow, wow. For me, um, when a, I remember when I first saw my first original, I was so humbled. <laughs> thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. <laughs> you know, again, because it's, it's, you know, we're transparent. It's out there, yeah. you know, hoping that someone loves what we do. Um, since then, um, even now, you know, I'm still humbled at the fact that someone would love something that comes out of my mind. You know, you know, uh, a lot of my paintings and stuff are actual subjects you know i can draw people you know i can draw athletes movie stars musicians all of that you know uh but i like to create something that may have been just sitting around in my mind and i want to put it out there and see where the world takes it and when somebody takes a liking to what i've done because of mm -hmm. its originality or you know how it made them feel or the detail it goes in is very humbling very humbling as an artist 
you know, and I'm just like, thank you. That particular piece that you saw on Facebook, that's called the Bayesian sensation. Um, when I was creating it, it was actually going to be something else, but I wanted to, I wanted to represent, you know, my roots. Um, my grandparents, well, my grand, great grandmother was from Barbados. Mm. And, uh, yeah. And my great grandfather was from Sierra Leone, Africa. So I'm working on something for him, but that particular piece of Barbados, I, I used to, I never got a chance to meet my great grandfather, but my great grandmother, you know, I used to see her a lot when I was young I'd come over there and, you know, we sit down and we talk. Um, you know, she passed away when I was still fairly young, maybe 10 or 11. Um, but that piece, I wanted to create a futuristic element music. Mm -hmm. She loved the guitar. So I did the guitar and I created the robot with the Bayesian colors, which is yellow and blue. And then I, you know, in keeping it in the Car Caribbean aspect, you know, I gave it made it very festive with the orange background. And there was what I call a negative space. In my paintings, I try not to have any negative space where it may be a lot of stuff on one side, but then over here, there's nothing, you know? So I try to fill the area depending on the subject. And one of the sides had a negative space. So I put a hummingbird there, put a hummingbird that just floats in the air. Cause that's, as far as I know, that's the only bird I know that can stay in one spot. <laughs> so I put him there and he's floating there and he's jamming with the, with the guy who's playing the guitar. And, uh, it, 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 it was, I mean, it, it, so many people, people had the money, it would have been sold so many times, so many times. Um, but this particular woman, she came to the house. We had a, a little viewing here. She came to the house. She loved it. And she was like, I want that piece. And she purchased it. You know, I, I want to say the word, use the word confidence. Mm. Uh, both of you too, if I stand corrected, both of you are, are full-time visual artists. Um, th th this is what you do to, to pay your bills. This is what you do when you wake up in the morning, you go go to your place of business and, and you do what you do. Um, uh, I mean, I, I love that because this is your passion. Um, this is what you love to do. Um, have you ever received any uh, backlash from others or even any self-doubt at some, some point in your career that, you know what? Maybe I need to work a regular nine to five job to make me to pay these bills. You know, maybe this being a visual artist, this is bringing enough money to the table. Or maybe there's others say, look, man, you, 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 better, you better do this on the side. Let, let this be like a part time job because, listen, you know, people don't buy art like that. I mean, it's just, just the backlash and, and the hate and all that stuff. Uh, have any of you ever experienced that? Ironically, the backlash that I received was while I was in corporate America. As I told you, my art was a hobby first. So mm -hmm. while in corporate America to relieve the stress, I would paint. And when I put my work out for the first time in those early years, the backlash was the um, criticism, harsh, very harsh criticism from people who didn't understand folk art. Mm -hmm. And they would be saying very negative things about my work, but I just laughed it off, you know, and, and I, I taught them how to, understand the stories behind the works of art and that again it was not about perspective and accuracy it was about life stories so i did get a lot of negative for many many years and that's why the delaware humanities forum i lift my hat to them they auditioned me for the speakers bureau and i traveled the state of delaware all the way to fenwick island for 20 years giving presentations on folk art and culture what is folk art? How does it distinguish itself from fine art? And nowadays, I don't hear about the rounded hands and where are the fingers. The question is, what is the story behind that piece? So it has paid off. Mm -hmm. Awesome. For me, um, surprisingly, the, the biggest supporter, who's my mother, after a while, at a point, she had said, maybe you should get a job, you know, you know, she comes from a, you know, although she very supportive, she's the one who pushed my art and got me all the supplies and everything that, you know, I may need in order to grow as an artist. But as I became a man, a family man, a, you know, husband, and I wanted to step out on faith and actually do this art full time, right. you know, for the first year, it was a little it was a little challenging, a little rough. And then she said, maybe you should, you know, get a job and, you know, s stick with it because you got to make sure you have the money for the house and, you know, family. And my wife is, is was a big support in, in you know, me pursuing my, my dream, my gift. 
And, uh, you know, but um, my mother is still alive, thank God. And she got a chance to see it, be, you know, become what it is and how I'm now, you know, I'm, I'm well-renowned. People are searching for me to do different things in art, whether it be books, portraits, um, characterizations. She got a chance to see that and she was like, you know, and, and I always say to her, I said, Ma, I, wanted, I want you to see me make it. And she said, son, you made it. She said, I got to see it. You know, I got to see it. You stuck with it and, and you made it. You're doing it. She said, I, um, you know, this is such a blessing. She, and she talks about it all the time and just my art and what I've, what I've managed to do. And I got to mention her in the same you know, breath is that, you know, it's because of her, you know, I'm doing it. Right. And may I follow up immediately on what he said about family yeah. support. Yeah. My, late, my late husband was my greatest fan of my art. And in 1993, when I had the pleasure of creating the cover for Out and About, which, which oh, was okay. a catalyst, catalyst for my business, my late husband collected dozens of them and walked the street and mm -hmm. gave them out and said, my wife did this. Right. So, <laughs> and that, this is what- That's a marketing strategy, yeah. Thanks to yeah. Out and About magazine in 1993, and that's how the Fate Gallery was licensed as a business that year, 29 years ago. May, awesome. it was May the 3rd that this magazine came out. So May the 3rd will be 29 years. Awesome. I tell you, yeah. this was an inspiration when I came down to Delaware. <laughs> you know, Demetrius, that there's someone, speaking of family, who looks just like you. He does comic books. And he's taken after his father. He's so tall now. I remember he's a little, little dude now. He's playing basketball. He's he's up here now. I guess he's like he's about six foot somewhere. But um, um what, what is it like seeing your son uh, follow through uh, your father's follow through your, your your footsteps as father? Oh man, it's it's it brings me nothing but joy. You know, um, earlier on, you know, five, six, seven, his passion for just telling stories, creating stories, was just mind blowing. Um, how I would always create all kinds of stories on loose leaf paper and, you know, every day he's drawing new characters, coming up with some really ideas. It's amazing. It's really good ideas. It's amazing how the mind, when it has nothing to worry about, except for just waking up, eating cereal, watching cartoons, you know, no, no, no. getting hugs from your, your parents, you know, can come up with these ideas and the names and everything. He would only make superheroes, um, okay. wouldn't make no villains, you know, or, I said, you gotta have you gotta have some type of conflict in your story. So, right, right. <laughs> you know, so now is the time to share that piece I gave you to give him. Yes, yeah. If I could get Bryce. Bryce. <laughs> I could get him. He was downstairs. <laughs> but he would create, he would do all this, all these things. Um later on he went on to create the comic book series when he was nine years old, Daddy Long Legs and the Inchworm. And uh I remember that. Yeah, I got that book, yeah. You know, and 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 when he when he did it, that was actually a turning point for uh, me as a visual artist, a painter, and everything. To where I started creating books. When I helped him with um, putting that together, putting that book together, um, we had it out, and we would go out in public and meet people. People would you know solicit me, I guess, to be uh, see if I would do their book, you know, work on their book, or if Bryce could do their book, and you know, and that's something that we we're working towards and having. Um, helping other children, inspiring them to put out their works. Here goes Bryce right here. Bring and him on, bring him on. Hi, Bryce. Come in the light. This is this big. This is Hi, Bryce. <laughs> How, How are you? How you doing, I'm, man? I'm good. Yeah. I knew you from you were five years old. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Oh, yeah. And uh, today I stopped up at Miss LaFate's uh, shop and she wanted to present my son with a, an amazing piece that she did. Oh, okay. We'll it's a tribute to the late and great Kobe Bryant. Yes, yes, because Bryce had just started playing uh, basketball for almost about a year now, and uh, he works real hard to learn the sport and condition himself and everything. He goes out there dedicated to practice and learn all that he can and works mm -hmm. out. And I put the post up on Facebook, and she saw it, and she was like, I would love to give him a piece. So I was honored to go pick this up today. He has an original sign from Miss Fate. And he wanted to say, thank you. Thank you so much. You are so welcome, Bryce. And I invite you to come to the gallery to see more. All right, thank you. Hey, hey Bryce, hey, Bryce, let me ask you, um, you, you ain't getting away that easy. Uh, what's, it like, 
what's it like going to the conventions? You know, I know you and your father, you went to conventions for your comic book and you're, you're meeting so many different artists who does similar work that you do. Um, how, how do you like meeting so many artists and being at conventions? It's really fun. Uh, just being able to meet like all the other artists and just seeing their work, it really inspires you like to come home and draw your own stuff. You know, it's really- we're, we're actually going to Boston this coming weekend. Uh, oh, okay. For an event that we were, um, we were a part of. So we're going to be showcasing, turn it later, we're going to be showcasing the uh, the books at the upcoming event out in Boston, Massachusetts. So I'm excited. Right. Yes, yes. It's amazing. And I love to inspire young children. You yeah. know, we, we must revive the village. It takes a village. Oh, it takes a village to raise a child. Ah, the village. Yeah, I love that. Village. And I adapted it to my business to say it takes a village to grow a business. Yes. So we must grow the business and we must raise the children. Right. So, Miss Eunice, I want to ask you, I want to ask both of you, uh, I just asked, let me just ask your son what it's like uh, attending conventions. So um, I'm quite sure both of you two had attended conventions as well as art exhibits and you ran into many so different uh, visual artists. Uh, what, what is it like being among your peers, being around those who do the type of work that you do? Talk about that Wonderful. experience. Back in the 90s, I used to travel to the three-day event show. It used to be called the October Gallery. Those were the good old days. I didn't mm. have a storefront and whatever I made was money you take home. And it mm. was such a joy. You had hundreds of artists there and thousands of people coming in. And that's where I built my clientele. And over the years, I kept the book that I, the, the signing book, Mm -hmm. I appraise a woman's work. They used to pay down on my work and say, we are collecting mm -hmm. art for our children. We don't have the money. We want originals. I would put them in a payment plan for five months. They'd send me a check and then come to get the piece. Well, a few years ago, I took my guest book and wrote them and appraised the piece that they paid low hundred dollars for. I appraised them to thousands of dollars. Nice, nice. For me, so it's not a joy, it's, it's just great. Absolutely, yeah. Brandywine Art Festival and the many festivals oh, around man. the city, I just love them. I have to agree, yeah. Uh, to piggyback off of her, just, it's it's a joy, you know, being around um, many artists, different artists. Um, just did a show not too long ago at the Chris White Gallery, um, actually before, a little bit before the pandemic, actually. But uh, it was wonderful being around so many visual artists, um, hearing their stories, uh, their work, and you know, being able to talk the lingo and you know, the creation process and you know, what inspired them. It's it's wonderful hearing the backstories yeah. of the artists. Um, even when uh, uh, Mr. Fade had came down to one of my uh, art shows that I did at uh, uh, Artscape a few years back, and we got a chance to talk, you know. Yeah about art, you know, in the beginning, the beginning process. And, and you gifted me a, a beautiful piece. Yes, yes, yeah. And, and, and I want to talk something about artists supporting other artists. Yes. That yes. is my yes. theme. Yes. I actually commissioned an artist of a different ethnicity a month ago to paint mm -hmm. a piece for me. Mm -hmm. And I paid her, actually I gave her much more than she asked for it. Right. So, you must support one another as artists. And I'm an advocate for that. I want living artists to benefit from the from their labor, from the fruits of their labor, no wait until they pass. And those right. out there who are holding back the purse string to, to wait, I encourage you, support living artists. Buy the art of those artists who are around. Right. They deserve to be able to make a living. Yes, right, exactly. Yes. I bought one of uh, Miss Lafayette's paintings a while back. Uh, one of the prints, the um, Unity. I got Unity. Um, another uh, known artist here in Delaware. Um, his name is James McGlone. He's a wood carver. I've got several of his pieces in my home as well. Um, Miss Lafayette has even she supported me. She's bought my son's comic books. Yes, um, I, I yeah. sent them to the Cayman Islands. Yeah. To my Yes. Our grand nephews, yes. It's, 
and uh, and it's and it's it's again I go back to humbling. It's humbling when another artist appreciates your work. You know, it has to move me. Something has to move me by an artist. I mean, I'm fascinated by just the the, the, the creative process and you know stories behind them. But there's certain pieces, I guess, as, even as you know, consumers, buyers, they you know certain pieces that just move you. And for me, and I artist, want to give credit um, to that same Carver, Jimmy, the woodman. Jimmy. Yes, yeah. he took one of my original paintings, One Love, One Heart, and carved it into, carved. yes, made it a 3D. And I had red, yellow, black, white images. And I said, Jimmy, I want a brown to make it all inclusive. And he put that brown in it. So when I signed it, I signed my name and I also put his name below to give him credit. He carved one of mine as well. One of, one of my pieces that I've created called um, Odyssey of Desire. Um, he wind up uh, carving. He carved one of the ladies that was riding on a. a I'm line. the best carver out there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He's amazing. Right. Okay. So I'm gonna give you two in closing, two minutes each, about two or two and a half minutes each. I'm gonna start off with Demetrius. Um, briefly, um, who are some of the visual artists that that you come to admire? Um, any upcoming pro projects, and how can people get a hold of you? Okay. Well. There's a lot of artists that I admire. I think one of the ones that really hit me um, as a young man, I would have to say Ernie Barnes. Ernie Barnes, um, he's one, um, you know him for Good Times, the Good Time picture. Oh yeah, I and, love that picture, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. and uh, another one is the person who I happen to be on the screen with, Mr. Fate. Right. Definitely, she inspires me. Um, and there's a you know quite a few others. Some of them go into comic book art. And, right. You know, there's uh, a few painters. Wally. Uh, there's a few. There's a few that that really you know inspire me as an artist and move me. Um, yeah. But uh, and let's see. The other question was where where we're going to be at next. Uh, yeah, you have coming projects and how can people co contact you for, uh, for work or. Okay. Networking. We, have, we got quite a few things that we're doing. Like I said, I'm going to be in Boston this coming Friday, Friday and Saturday. Saturday is the actual event. It's going to take place at the, uh, I believe it's at the Boston College, uh, where we're going to be there for a um, comic book festival. Um, then we're also going to be at the uh, Dover Con, uh, June, June 16th, I believe it is, down in Dover here in Delaware. And uh, in August, August 5th and 6th, uh, both myself and my partner, Andre Jones, is going to be doing our second annual Comic Con at uh, Legendary Artscape, 205 North Market Street. Wonderful. <laughs> August, okay, for me, yeah. the artist. Oh, oh and how you can contact me? You got, no, how you can oh. contact me? Okay. Uh, oh, yeah. Oh, 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 yeah. One other thing. And I'm going to be at Zolly's uh, May. What's that? May twenty third. Okay. May twenty third. I'm gonna be at Zolly's in old in old uh, Newcastle, and uh, May twenty third. I'm gonna be exhibiting some of my new work there. Awesome. And how you can contact me is uh, Demetrius Bullock, Demetrius Motion Bullock on Facebook, and uh, what's the other one? And Motion Illustrations. That's my website. Motion Illustrations with a Z at the end of illustrations. All right, Miss Eunice, take us home. Yes, I just want to single out some artists in the city. There are phenomenal artists around, but my fellow artists, and we are, he said they should name the street after us, two famous artists living in the same location, K.O. Sims. K.O. Sims. I must applaud K.O. Sims. He took on getting young people to paint boarded, uh, boarded up places. Guys, you have to see to believe it. So wow. I, I want to raise my hat to K.O. Sims for what he has done and we have worked together and we have greater works to do. Joe Redbird, my curator for seven years. She's a phenomenal artist, vibrant acrylics. Janice King, the first artist I mentored since I opened the gallery and she exhibited there and she has grown tremendously. Yes, she has. James White, yes. My youth, my youth mentee, Deborah Tate. 
emerging artist student who created 25 pieces under my mentorship. Mm -hmm. And I just want to celebrate all the artists in the city. I don't have time to name them. Okay, physical location, 227, don't forget that old movie, 227 North Market Street, across from Parsons in the same block with Al Sporting Goods, can't miss it. Yeah. Hours are Tuesday through Saturday from five, um, 11 to five. I'm online, two places, www.thefakegallery.com. That's my personal website. And the website to get my merchandise is fineartamerica.com. Just type Eunice Lafayette in the search bar. And my phone number for the gallery, 302-656-6786. It takes a village to grow a business. Support local artists, support the village. Absolutely. Absolutely. Now on that note, I'd like to thank you both for your great guests for being on tonight. It was an outstanding program. Um, we got to do this again in the future. So, um, yeah, we, we always stay in contact with one another. And um, God bless and have a safe week. And thank, thank you for your vision, Omar. You're doing a phenomenal job. Thank yes, you. Sir, thank, you. thank you. Thank cool. you. All right. Everybody have a safe week. Yeah. All right. All oh, right, yeah. everybody. Yeah, have a great nice night. Subscribe and share. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Thank